Good evening. It is good to see you here tonight. And as Caitlin said, it's Epiphany Sunday, the day when we remember the... Um, what are we going to call them? Wise men? Or maybe instead go with the hymn we just sang and call them kings. Or maybe astronomers or even astrologers. Not nearly as big a difference in the ancient world between the two as in ours. Or maybe it's better to do just what many people do now, is stick with the ancient Greek word magi, which is actually borrowed from an ancient Persian word and covers the waterfront of meaning from wise men to astronomers to astrologers. So today, it is Epiphany Sunday, the day when we remember the three. Well, how many were there? Matthew's Gospel, which we're going to get to in a minute, I promise, says that the Magi brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But Matthew's Gospel leaves the number of givers unspecified. So, of course, tradition, along with innumerable Christmas pageants and creches, says that there were three wise men, magi, whatever we're going to call them. Tradition even gives them names, Melchior, Balthasar, and Caspar, and even gives them continents. Melchior from Europe, Balthasar from Asia, and Caspar from Africa. In fact, pull out your bulletin for a second. If you take a look at the print on the front, that's got to be Melchior, the older one. He always has a long beard. He's carrying gold from Europe. Caspar from Africa in the middle with myrrh. And Balthasar, who's kneeling, with carrying frankincense on the pillow. So today is Epiphany Sunday, the day when we remember the, well, let's call them Magi, however many there were, whatever their names were and wherever they were from, who brought gold and frankincense and myrrh to the baby Jesus. I'll come back to all of this tradition in a little bit, but for now, as we read Matthew's Gospel, I want you to think of the difference between verses 10 and 11 on the one hand, where we're told that the Magi rejoiced exceedingly with great joy and knelt in worship before the baby Jesus. The difference between those two verses and verse 12, where the Magi are running for their lives. If nothing else, try to imagine the different expressions that might be on their faces. Listen now for God's word to the church, the visit of the Magi, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you found him, Bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and Redeemer. Amen. After all that preamble, you probably think that I'm going to play the Epiphany Scrooge. 
either of the Protestant variety, ready to debunk all those traditions in the name of sticking strictly to Scripture, or of the historical variety, ready to debunk them in the name of historical veracity or at least probability. But I promise, no epiphany bah humbug from me. I love epiphany and all its traditions. To my mind, no Christmas pageant is complete without the three wise men. And of course, we most certainly have them in our creches. In fact, some of you can see we haven't pulled down the decorations yet. So I brought in the wise men from our house. And also, I've got a little booklet there, The Traditions of Epiphany, with a little bit of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but I'm not really sure about the gold. Anyway, I love Epiphany. In fact, you could argue that all these traditions do have a basis in Scripture. Whatever else we might say about them, it's clear that the Magi are foreigners, not Jews. Matthew clearly wants to show that Jesus is the Savior of all people, all nations, Hence, it makes sense to have them come, as tradition does, from the far ends of the earth. And yet, Matthew also wants to remind us that salvation comes to all nations through the Jews. Hence, the Magi use reason and observation to get to Jerusalem to follow the star. But once there, they must rely on the Hebrew scriptures, specifically the prophets, to find God, to find the Messiah, to have their epiphany. Like I say, it's great stuff. I love the traditions around Epiphany. But before I get to God bless us, everyone, and I will, I promise, a few more words about Epiphany. Epiphany, well, you know, the word means just manifestation or appearance. First, perhaps the manifestation or appearance of truth. You know, when we say, aha, now I see it. But especially the manifestation or appearance of divine truth even the manifestation or appearance of God, God's self. So the Magi had an epiphany when they saw Jesus there and knelt before him. They were in the presence of God. But theirs is not the only epiphany. One of the things I want to say today is that all of us, in one way or another, at one time or another, I'm betting at least, all of us have had our epiphanies. All of us have had times, no, probably not with guiding stars and Herod in the background, but times when we knew with utter conviction that we were in the presence of God. The 20th century poet W.H. Auden had one such epiphany. Again, I'm not saying that all epiphanies are like his either, but because he's a poet gifted with words, Often, Auden manages to describe his epiphany in a way that may help us find words for our epiphanies. At least that's what he did for me. See if it's true for you. It's a longish quotation, but worth it, I think, so bear with me. Auden describes his epiphany like this. One fine summer night in June 1933, I was sitting on a lawn after dinner with three colleagues, two women and one man. We were talking casually about everyday matters when, quite suddenly and unexpectedly, something happened. I felt myself invaded by a power which, though I consented to it, was irresistible and certainly not my own power. For the first time in my life, I knew exactly, because thanks to the power, I was doing it. I knew exactly what it meant to love one's neighbor as oneself. I was also certain that though the conversation continued to be perfectly ordinary, that my three colleagues had the same experience. In the case of one of them, I was able to confirm this. My personal feelings towards them were unchanged. They were still colleagues, not intimate friends. But I felt their existence in themselves to be of infinite value, and I rejoiced in it. And as Auden continues, he picks up and develops that idea of rejoicing. He says this, As I sat there, I recalled with shame the many occasions on which I had been spiteful, snobbish, selfish. But the immediate joy was greater than the shame. For I knew that, so long as I was possessed by this spirit, it would be literally impossible for me to deliberately injure another human being. I also knew that the power would, of course, be withdrawn sooner or later, 
and that when it did, my greed and self-regard would return. The experience lasted in its full intensity for about two hours. When I awoke the next morning, it was present, though weaker, and it did not vanish completely for two days or so. The memory of the experience has not prevented me from making use of others, grossly and often, but it has made it much more difficult for me to deceive myself about what I'm up to when I do that. Among the various factors that brought me back to the Christian faith, Auden was an adult convert, the memory of this experience and asking it myself what it could mean was one of the most crucial. I don't know about you, but that's a wonderful account of an epiphany, I think. The sense of being in the presence of, of being invaded by an irresistible power greater than oneself, God. A power that not only makes me aware of the infinite value of others, but enables me to rejoice in that value. Enables me, in other words, to love my neighbor as I love myself. A power whose immeasurable goodness Yes, by contrast, makes me aware of my own past failings and shortcomings. But more than that, the immeasurable goodness of this power gives me much more than that, joy. 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 What did Matthew say about the Magi? They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That is an epiphany a startling, joyful awareness of being in the presence of God. Whether it happens in a cold winter night in the year 4 BCE in Bethlehem or a fine summer night in June 1933 or tonight as you come forward to take communion, all of that is incidental. What matters, what's essential is the joy, the joy of being in the presence of God. And of course, it doesn't last, at least not in its initial intensity. Auden describes his epiphany as slowly fading over two days. In my experience, that's a gracious plenty, perhaps nearly overwhelming. And though we don't know how many days the Magi spent adoring Jesus in Bethlehem, we do know that their epiphany too eventually came to an end. They had to go back home. Which brings us to verse 12. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The 20th century Anglo-American poet T.S. Eliot wrote a poem called Journey of the Magi. I've exerted it in your bulletins. It's on page 5 if you want to take a look as I read some parts of it. One of the remarkable things about Eliot's poems is how few words he gives to the epiphany itself. What he does instead, as the title suggests, is focus on the journey of the Magi, how long and how hard it was to get there, and especially the journey home, the long years afterwards. The poem is poetical conceit, narrated by one of the Magi. Imagine, let's say, Melchior in his old age saying this. Take a look and listen cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year, for a journey and such a long journey, the ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter, a hard time we had of it. I don't know, but since the 12 days of Christmas have been 12 days of snow comer, sometime I just thought of that poem. Anyway, going through all that snow, when they finally get closer to their destination, coming down to a temperate valley, and here, Eliot gives us an oblique set of Christ images. He does this, the running stream, the three trees, the old white horse, because he's T.S. Eliot and he's a poet. But when the Magi finally get there, to Jesus, this is all we get. And arriving at evening, not a moment too soon, finding the place, it was, you might say, satisfactory. And that's it. No mention of the baby, no less worshiping the baby, no mention of Mary or Joseph, no mention of Herod for that matter, no mention of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, no mention of the dream, no mention of the rejoicing greatly with great joy. Only this, 
finding the place, it was, you might say, satisfactory. Maybe Eliot is the epiphany Scrooge. But not really, I think. Because in all seriousness, although Eliot's poem is in a different key, and although the joy is understated, you might even say muted, Eliot makes one of the same poem points that Auden's account does. You never forget an epiphany. All this was a long time ago, but I still remember, Eliot's narrator says. And Auden said this, the memory of that experience has not prevented me from making use of others, but it has made it much more difficult for me to do that. And the memory of this experience and asking myself what it could mean was one of the most crucial factors that brought me back to the Christian faith. You never forget an epiphany. But in the hours and days and months and years after the epiphany, although the epiphany remains a memorable, life-changing experience, God's presence is no longer immediately felt. Instead, what we have is a memory. And think about this with me. I think what memories do best, at least the good memories, memories fill us with longing. Right now, let's try an experiment. Just do this for me. Take a moment, shut your eyes if you like, and remember someone. Someone you loved, still love, and will always love, but someone who is no longer in this world. Remember that person. And my bet is, right now, that memory fills you with longing just to see that person again even if only for a day, an hour, if only to say one thing, I love you, fills you with a longing to see that face again, a longing to touch that face. Okay, open your eyes. When it comes to God and our joy in the presence of God, all of this gets raised to the nth degree. And so it's an odd thing, an epiphany for all the joy, the inexpressible joy when we're having it, an epiphany can leave us with a sense of longing, longing for something beyond this world, and thus leave us with a sense of dissatisfaction with this world. Eliot's poem again. When we return to our places, these kingdoms, we were no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. Again, he's kind of the ep epiphany Scrooge. But think about it. He longs so much for that joy. He's willing to die to find it again. So on this Epiphany Sunday, the advice I'm going to give is not remember the Magi's Epiphany and remember your own. The Magi's Epiphany is so impressed on our cultural memory and your epiphanies, I'm sure, are so impressed on your own individual memories, there's no real danger of our forgetting them. In fact, the real danger, at least when it comes to our own, is that we might forget everything else. No, on Epiphany Sunday, the advice I really want to offer is this. Honor the longing. Honor the longing that the epi epiphany produces. Honor that longing because it's a testament a witness to the reality of the epiphany, the reality of the joy, the reality of God's presence. We were made for God, made to be in the presence of God, and an epiphany gives us some experience, however partial, however incomplete, however short in duration, an epiphany gives us some experience of being in God's presence. And we were made for that. And so we long for that. Epiphany gives us a foretaste of God's kingdom. When we will see that face, that face you remembered, and God's face. And yes, even touch that face. In the next week, months, in the course of the coming year, there will be times for me, and I'm sure for all of us, times when the joy of Christmas, 
the baby in the manger, the joy of being in God's presence, the joy of God with us, Emmanuel. There will be times when all that will seem only a memory, and only a distant memory at that. There will be times, in fact, let's be honest, there already have been times over the past month or so, even during the Christmas season, yes, when our world seems devoid of God. But this was true for the Magi and their world too, wasn't it? Think of them, verse 12 again, sneaking out of town at night by a different road, casting furtive glances over their shoulders, always fearful that Herod's henchmen were coming right behind them. Think of them at some point saying their goodbyes in a rushed and hushed way that seems ridiculously incongruous with the experience and the joy they have just shared. Think of them as they go on their long and now separate treks back to their now alien kingdoms. Think of them. But my hunch is that the Magi not only remembered their epiphany, they also honored the longing that that epiphany put in them. They, too, live lives longing to experience again that rejoicing with great joy that they experience as they knelt in worship before that baby, the presence of God. But that baby in the manger is worthy of worship because that baby is a promise, a promise for the Magi and for us. That baby is the promise that they and we will have other epiphanies, other epiphanies in this life, however partial and incomplete, that will help us on our way home. But the real promise of that baby in the manger is that we will know that joy, that joy of epiphany, completely and forever. No, one epiphany is not enough. We are promised in that baby in the manger, that joy, that joy of being in God's presence, will be forever. And we long for that joy. We should honor that longing in the year ahead. God bless us, everyone. Amen.